three-day blockbuster brought in the new eras of both how teams operate and how they are covered. Plus, Pat McAfee has a new media gig and not with a network that's paying him $17 million per year. And we're speaking with the president of EA Sports on how they work with teams and leagues and the biggest NIL deal in history. It's Monday, September 30th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're looking at all the business angles of the Carl Anthony Towns trade with our reporter Colin Salau. Tuned in columnist Mike McCarthy joins to discuss Pat McAfee's latest move, the huge ratings for Thursday Night Football, and a strange rumor about who could be the new Woj at ESPN. Plus, Cam Weber, president of EA Sports, discusses the resurrection of their college football franchise and the transition of their FIFA series to EA Sports FC. Plus, the Yannick Sinner controversy returns and David Tepper suddenly has a case as the best owner in sports. First, let's hit some headlines. We begin in the NFL. The LA Chargers have a new minority owner in Tom Gores, who is set to acquire a 27% stake of the team. Gores is also the majority owner of the Detroit Pistons, which he purchased in 2011 for a price of $325 million, that's now worth over $3 billion. The Chargers have increased their value from $72 million back in 1984 to more than $5 billion now, according to Forbes. In case you needed any reminder as to why private equity firms are willing to accept a lot of onerous terms to get in on NFL ownership. Over on the college side, we begin with a photo finish in Tuscaloosa. Georgia and Alabama played their first matchup of the post-Saban era on Saturday night, and the rivalry still delivered. A game that started 28-0 in Alabama's favor turned into a 41-34 win for the Crimson Tide, which included both teams scoring in the final three minutes. Although the CFB sidelines lost one of its most recognizable faces in Saban, he's helping ESPN set viewership records for college game day while watching these historic rivalries play out from the booth. Speaking of new eras, Arch Manning is just about as good as a, of a stopgap as you can get, leading Texas to its first SEC in-conference win over the weekend. The Longhorns crushed Mississippi State 35-13 behind 324 yards and two touchdowns from Manning, who only missed six targets all game. It seems like Quinn Ewers could be back as soon as next week, but when Arch's time comes, he'll undoubtedly be one of the biggest NIL stars in college football. But NIL isn't for everyone. In the wake of QB Matt Sluka redshirting over NIL disputes, UNLV chugs along and wins their fourth consecutive game. Last week, Circa Sports offered to pay the $100,000 to keep Sluka on the roster, but school officials kept it plain and simple with their response telling Action Network, we won't be doing business with the Sluka family again. At 4-0, maybe they don't need to, and I'm very curious about what else is going to come out here. On the realignment side of things, ESPN is reporting that Texas State has been given a verbal offer to join the Mountain West Conference, while Northern Illinois says that no official offer has been extended to them. Meanwhile, FOS reporter Amanda Kristovich has confirmed that seven remaining members of the Mountain West Conference have signed a retention agreement which should prevent the Pac-12 from poaching more of their teams. The CFB musical chairs continues. Flipping over to the basketball world, the WNBA gave out some more season-long awards over the weekend, with Caitlin Clark winning Rookie of the Year on Friday, Nafisa Collier taking home Defensive Player of the Year on Sunday. Meanwhile, Minnesota Lynx coach Cheryl Reeve was named both the Basketball Executive of the Year and Coach of the Year, making her the league's only four-time Coach of the Year winner. But the biggest bombshell of the weekend came from a sport that's out of season, pretty classic for the NBA. The Minnesota Timberwolves traded Carl Anthony Towns, their longest tenured player and the number one overall pick in the 2015 draft, to the New York Knicks, who broke up their Villanova Four by shipping out Dante DiVincenzo in the deal, along with Julius Randle. The Wolves are coming off their first Western Conference Finals appearance since the Kevin Garnett era, but the new CBA forces teams to make tough decisions. My colleague Colin Sallow joins us next to discuss the deal and why finances are at the center of it all. Joined now by front office sports reporter Colin Salau. Welcome, Colin. Hey, Owen. Great to have you on. So, big news in Knicks world. Carl Anthony Towns is headed to the Big Apple for Julius Randle and Dante DiVincenzo. Um, a lot of angles here, but how how is this trade kind of a sign of the the new era we're in in basketball that is kind of dictated by the new CBA? That's actually the essence of why the Wolves made this trade, right? A lot of people are are looking like, hey, it is the, you're trading Carl Anthony Towns. You guys made the Western Conference Finals last year. He played well. But the truth of the matter is they had the second highest payroll entering this year. They were well over the second apron. And a lot of people are doubting what the second apron's um, uh, penalties are. There are a ton, including potentially losing first round picks down the line, um, flexibility in terms of trades. And Carl Anthony Towns was the number one highest paid player on the Wolves 
and his contract was going on for a couple of, for I believe four more seasons. Whereas with Julius Randle and Dante DiVincenzo, you have shorter contracts and tradable pieces and combined, they make less than Carl Anthony Towns. So I think that it's very clear that that's what this trade was about, the CBA. And ultimately, the CBA is changing how all teams operate. Look at the 2022 or 2023 champion Denver Nuggets. Um, They have lost several key pieces on their team. And a lot of it is because of this CBA and making sure that they are operating properly under uh, the right um, financial um, uh, ceilings, right? So I think it's 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 a huge part of the league right now, and specifically for smaller franchises, they're going to be making these trades. Yeah, I mean, with that Nuggets team after they won the championship, I was like, all right, they, they like barely broke a sweat doing that. It just feels like they're just going to dominate now. Um, now it feels like the Celtics are going to be that team, but um, but maybe not. It's going to be very hard to have these you know Bulls like dynasties um in in the modern nba or the war even warriors like dynasties and i think that's kind of what adam silver's preach that he's wanted he wants more parity in the league and that's why they instituted this cba you're not seeing five years in a row or x number of years in a row of Cavs warriors right you're seeing a, a smaller market team like the nuggets win and then now they're like wait we have we can't re-sign bruce brown or we can't we have to give up kcp and i i also think that to your point the Celtics are going to have another chance to to win the championship. They're going to be the favorites to win again this year. But they might be paying a, about 500 million the next season in salary and penalties. And they might be crippling themselves down the line and potentially having a team that will be mediocre for 5, 10 years. So you're going to see really I think the effects of this CBA maybe in a year or two when potentially the Celtics after all this success might have to trade one or two of those major pieces. Yeah. And I think the the fact that you can lose draft picks for going over the second apron, that's huge because you would get the occasional like Steve Cohen type owner who's just like, you know what? It's I'm, I'm a billionaire. I, I want a championship. I'm just going to pay whatever I have to pay to get the players that, you know, the baseball or sorry, the basketball ops here, uh, people say we should get. Um, but if you're losing draft picks, it means you're you're losing like the ability to maintain a, a excellent team. And I think one thing that a lot of people are forgetting there is draft picks are also assets for trades that don't have a salary on them. So you could use that to trade. And a lot of people are also forgetting that going over certain levels of the apron also cripple you from a flexibility standpoint because you can't use trade exceptions. You can't use other certain things like uh, sign players on mid-level exceptions. Those are huge in building a team and giving you the flexibility to make trades at all. So going over those things, maybe they, they, see, they don't seem sexy, but they're huge for the people in the front office. Yeah. And, and as a Knicks fan, I'm like a little nervous about all this stuff right now. I feel like we lost some depth. We, we lost another draft pick. Uh, it's obviously a loaded team now, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Teams are going in different ways here. There's the Celtics and the Knicks who are like, we're just going to go all in. We've never, we don't know what's going to happen, but We'll figure it out down the line. And then there are teams that are like, we're going to be conservative. We have like the Nuggets and the Wolves. Like we can't, we can't risk it. And we'll see what happens in two years because this CBA just kind of kicked in. It, it, what, what happens in three or four years is really going to signal, you know, what the right approach was. We also, this is also kind of the, a signal of another new era, which is the new era of basketball news breaking in, without Woj. Um, Adrian Wojnarowski. Uh, so Shams Tarani, I believe, broke the the trade. But after that, uh, the details kind of came in. Um, <clears throat> it was kind of saw a little peek at what what it's like post Woj. Yeah, I think that a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of reporting right now, including from our own Michael McCarthy, about who's going to replace Woj potentially. And I think the angle for a lot of people is who's going to replace Woj. When I'll go back to my analogy of the to to the Warriors and Cavs. Where like for years it was Warriors, Cavs, Warriors, Cavs, Warriors, Cavs. And now it's like it's a mix, right? It everyone's thinking who's gonna replace Woj when the truth is, yeah, Shams will probably still be there, but it might actually just be a collection of people, and maybe one or two people will stand out and 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 make their case. But there there it's it's hard. There's no science to this, right? This this whole or journalists. Um, you can't just replicate relationships with with front office members. You have to build those things. So 
yeah, maybe they ESPN wants someone to replace Woj, but does you know the person who works at the front office of Team X have the same relationship with that replacement that they did with Woj? It's not hard to to just you know get out of thin air, and I think it might be a collection of people for a while. Right. I mean, there were only two of these guys for a long time, so it's we can't just be like, okay, well now just go get another one because who is that person? Exactly. Um, I, yeah. I, I really wouldn't be shocked if you're going to see several names breaking news this year. Shams being the big one. And then, you know, we'll be like, oh, hey, you know, Ramona Shelburne's breaking news. Zach Lowe, wherever he ends up, might break news. You know, it, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. yeah, 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 it should be. Colin Salo, thanks so much for joining us. Of course. Thanks for having me. Angel Reese took to Twitter to express her sadness over the Chicago Sky firing Teresa Weatherspoon as head coach after a single season. Reese said she was heartbroken and that she was the only person that believed in me, the one that trusted me. Many don't even know what it's like to be a black woman in sports when nobody believes in you. The Sky went 13-27 and 27 and narrowly missed the playoffs, in part due to a slew of injuries, including to Reese. She continues to be one of the most attention-getting players in the league, even as the playoffs continue without her. Staying in the Windy City, the Chicago White Sox made it official they now have the most losses of any team in baseball's modern era, which begins in 1901. By the way, the only reason that it is the modern era line is to mark the new century. Baseball didn't change in any big way in 1901. If not for that arbitrary line, the White Sox would not hold the record for most losses in MLB history. That belongs to the 1899 Cleveland Spiders. Even in the modern era, the White Sox don't actually have the worst winning percentage. That belongs to the 1916 Philadelphia Athletics, who went 36 and 117. However, since baseball integrated in 1947, which should maybe be the actual modern era, the White Sox are indeed the worst team after passing the 1962 Mets with their 121st loss. It takes the full suite of mismanagement, underperformance, and bad luck to hit lows this low. MLB was bottom heavy this year. We won't have any 100 win teams, but there are three 100 loss teams and the Angels almost made it four. It's too early to say if there's a structural reason for that, but the expanded wild card may incentivize teams to aim to be just above average and hope things work out in the playoffs. The Yannick Sinner controversy is back. The World Anti-Doping Agency has appealed the decision to clear Sinner of any wrongdoing and has requested that the top tennis player in the world be banned for one to two years. The org did not go into details beyond saying, quote, the finding of no fault or negligence was not correct under the applicable rules. Sinner tested positive twice for a banned substance called Clostabol, but two independent tribunals determined that he was not at fault. Sinner's explanation is a little odd. He says that his trainer cut his hand and used an over-the-counter healing spray, which contained Clostabol, and then gave Sinner massages, which transferred the substance to him. I'm surprised that would be enough to trigger two positive tests, but apparently that explanation was enough for two separate groups that looked into this. We'll see if the Court of Arbitration for Sport agrees, or if this case suddenly upends the tennis world. Over to the NFL, Carolina Panthers owner David Tepper is not popular among the team's fans, but the state has reason to celebrate him. Tepper and his wife Nicole have donated $3 million to recovery efforts in North and South Carolina in response to the devastation caused by Hurricane Helene. Meanwhile, FEMA designated four NFL stadiums for, for potential use as shelters in major disasters. Those four are Acrature Stadium in Pittsburgh, MetLife Stadium in New Jersey, Lumen Field in Seattle, and Raymond James Stadium in Tampa. The federal agency is also looking at SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles as a potential fifth site. There's lots of intrigue in the world of sports media. We saw the first major news break in the post-Woj era, and there's a strange rumor about who could replace Wojnarowski at ESPN. Meanwhile, Pat McAfee has a new gig, not at ESPN. My colleague Mike McCarthy has the latest on all of that, and he joins us next. Joined now by front office sports tuned in columnist Mike McCarthy. Welcome, Mike. Great to be here, Owen. Great to have you. So uh, we just got the news that Pat McAfee will have a recurring spot on the NFL Network's NFL Game Day Morning with Rich Eisen. Uh, what's your reaction to this? First of all, I think there's three Pat McAfee's because, I mean, the amount of gigs that this guy has between college game day and his weekday show and professional wrestling, he, he must have cloned himself. But my real reaction is this is kind of weird, right? ESPN's paying $17 million a year to license his show, and he's going on the NFL Network's Sunday morning show. 
uh, you know, isn't there a little something called ESPN Sunday NFL Countdown, which is hosted by Greeny, who's a big fan and a big supporter of Pat McAfee. As a matter of fact, Mike Greenberg was one of the first people to bring Pat onto ESPN there. So if you ask me, it's kind of weird. I got to ask some questions about this Owen, and get some answers. Yeah, I mean, there, there's this ongoing question of will will they will there be some kind of divorce at some point with ESPN and McAfee I don't really see it because they're paying him so much money they're so invested in him being like one of their you know top three guys basically that brings eyeballs um but I don't know is he getting himself leverage or yeah, and what does this say to you about the relationship between ESPN and McAfee? What it tells me is there's the McAfee rules, right? Remember the Jordan rules? Like, you know, there's one set of rules for a superstar, and there's one set of rules for everybody else. And I think even inside ESPN, there's an acknowledgement that the rules that apply to 99% of the employees there don't apply to Pat McAfee. He calls his boss a rat. He gets away with it, Right. He uh, he going to, he's going to work uh, for NFL Network. He's you know freelancing over there. You know again, he's not a full time employee for ESPN. So technically, the rules don't apply to him. But I also think it's it's a leverage thing, as you mentioned here, Owen. I mean, he's a guy who likes to push the boundaries and let everybody know that he's ultimately in charge of Pat McAfee. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's stick with the NFL. Thursday Night Football had, you know, more blowout ratings with the Giants and Cowboys. Uh, What do we know there? Well, it was the most streamed regular season game of all time, peaking at over 18 million. And what I thought about uh, this number was two things, Owen. One, if Amazon is now averaging 16 million viewers on a stream, that's not too far from the linear average of 18 million. So I, I think that the old idea that You can't take a big sporting event and put it on streaming is quickly going by the wayside. People are getting used to streaming. And and second of all, it just shows you, you know, the enduring power of the Cowboys. Uh, You know, they're a lousy team. Uh, It was a lousy game. It was filled with the, you know, flags. The Giants stink. And yet, you know, they call the most streamed regular season NFL game of all time. I mean, we, we did a big story about this last week, Owen, in that the Chiefs, and the Cowboys are really the two big draws. I mean, between them, they've appeared in the five most watched games this season. And the Chiefs are actually bigger than the Cowboys now. But the Cowboys are the Cowboys. Even if they stink, they draw millions of viewers. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing. And yeah, streaming has, you know, it's not fully caught up to linear. But, you know, this isn't like a five-year thing, it feels like. Yes. This is like, we're, we're almost there. This isn't like the old days where, you know, they would get seven or nine million. I mean, 16 million is a serious number. And the other thing about Amazon, which the NFL loves, and frankly, all the leagues love, is they draw a younger viewer. The Amazon Thursday Night Football viewer is on average seven years younger than the linear viewers for ESPN and CBS and uh, NBC. So that it makes a big deal to NFL executives. Yeah, definitely. Let's hop over to the NBA. We got a weird report. Uh, I thought it was weird that, um, you know, because Woad, Woj has left ESPN. Yep. They need a new Woj. They need a new guy who can get all the scoops on the NBA. Uh, a lot of, obviously, smoke around Shams Tarania eventually making his yep. way there. We got this report that Jeff Passan, who is that guy for baseball for ESPN, right. could hop over to the NBA. What do you think here? A lot of head scratching. The Athletic reported this Saturday that Passan, who's probably the top baseball insider, could in essence, shift beats and become the Woj at ESPN. Personally, I think that's a long shot. I still think Shams Charania is in the the pole position to get this. Or number three, that ESPN could just continue to go with this closer by committee approach, which you saw with the Carl Anthony Town story, where you got Ramona Shelberg and Brian Windhorst and all this. But I I think it was a a sexy idea, uh, you know, out of curiosity, I'd love to see it happen because it's funny um, when these insiders got started, a lot of them did switch, switch beats. You know, the late great Chris Mortensen, people don't realize this was actually a baseball reporter and he switched to football and became one of the greatest insiders of all time. So it has happened and it could happen. I just don't think it's likely. Yeah. I just, I mean, I feel like part of what makes these guys, these guys is, is their Rolodexes, or I guess, you know, yeah. now it's not Rolodexes anymore, but um, I mean, passing, I'm sure could build up the contacts he needs in, you know, in not too much time, but 
he's so deep in MLB. Um, yeah. I, I would just be surprised if um, uh, there was any kind, you know, like, why not keep your, your MVP in baseball, in baseball yes. and, you know, just find the next guy in basketball. Yeah. I mean, and he, here's the thing about it too, is, you know, you were dealing with human beings here, right? With egos. So if you're an uh, ESPN NBA insider, if you're a wind horse, or you're Tim Bontemps, or you're Ramona Shelburne, or Bobby Marks, and all of a sudden this guy comes in and Bigfoot's on your beat, and you got to give way to a guy, you know what I mean, who's uh, doing reporting one on one, you know, I don't know, you know, th- th- these are these are these are questions you're dealing with human beings, and you know people might not like to see somebody come in and just be installed number one, making the most money, having the most power over on a beat that they've uh, slaved over for twenty five years. Yeah, absolutely. So, which is why I think it's not going to happen, but I guess we'll see. Mike McCarthy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. To make college football 25 as realistic as possible, EA Sports gave out the biggest NIL deal in college sports history, offering $600 and a copy of the game to every player on every FBS team. Meanwhile, the new EA Sports FC game was just released, making it the second iteration of the series since EA and FIFA parted ways. I spoke to EA Sports president Cam Weber on why the company was motivated to make all the deals that they did and where they fit into the sports entertainment landscape. That conversation is coming up next. Joined now by EA Sports president Cam Weber. Welcome, Cam. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. So we're now into the college football season, and the first one in your deal offered to all FBS players is in effect. What can you tell us about the popularity of College Football 25 and what it's meant to have players' names, images, and likenesses as part of it? Yeah, it, I mean, the launch has been huge. I mean, we've talked about the success that it had and the reach that it had. I mean, I think it's one of the biggest moments in sports entertainment so far this year, and it's certainly the biggest launch in North America of any video game um, in, in, in this market uh, so far this year. So it's been, it's been a huge success. Um, the NIL deal and in particular, you know, just having authentic players in the game, you know, and, and the, the large number of players that signed up and, and we got such good coverage of the teams and, and, and the players themselves, it made for a, a huge value add to the game. Um, and I'm someone who, not only have I played, you know, this franchise my whole life and the old games that we used to make, I also made some of those games and, you know, in still play 12, 13, 14 and so on. So um, it's been fun to see what we were able to build with a longer development cycle as well. And, and then what we were able to deliver to fans. Um, the NIL deal in particular was an interesting one. Um, you know, it was uncharted waters for us. Um, we wanted to design a program that would be inclusive at a baseline level. We wanted to include as many of these players across the country as possible. You're talking about 134, you know, FBS schools, rosters of, you know, 85 plus player rosters that we're getting from all these schools. So this is a massive amount of players, over 11,000 players. Um, and we wanted to design a program that would allow all of them to participate. Anyone who's on those final rosters and, and that were, you know, in, on the team and, and wanted to be part of what we were doing, we wanted to provide that opportunity. So we, we created a multi-tiered system. Uh, the one that most people hear about in the media is the broad one where they all got a, a, a check and a free copy of the game. And that's kind of the baseline that allowed us to get the vast majority of players from across the country, which was awesome. And then we also did some ambassador deals, I think close to about 150 particular college stars, really recognized big name college stars where we did 
larger deals with those. And those were all individually done. Um, and, you know, that allowed us to have, you know, like the, a mini army of uh, recognizable college stars that were also promoting our game for us, playing the game, so, you know, sharing it on their social platforms. And then, of course, we had our cover athletes as well, which is a whole other tier of deal. So we had this complex uh, program that allowed us to get all these different tiers of players. But the, the best part about it was that it was inclusive and allowed us to get this massive audience. Um, and I would say in terms of the success of the game, um, I mean, I, I'd love to recognize my team and the great job they did in building a game that really delivered on the unique traditions and pageantry um, and the, the offenses and defense and the real feel from each of those 134 schools. Cause I think they did a fantastic job. But in terms of like promoting the game, it was amazing to see when the game went live in July. All of these athletes that had signed up, we had, you know, almost 12,000 of them. They were all in training camp. They were all playing our game in between their practices. And then they were just talking to the world. They were so excited to be part of the game and using their social platforms to promote our game. And it really just felt like the game started to promote itself and the entire college football community got behind it. And a lot of that was driven by this army of athletes that were a part of the game. So it was a community driven launch and it's been a labor of love for the team. And, and it's, it's been successful beyond, far beyond our expectations. And can you say about how many players took you up on at least one of those offers? Yeah, the vast, vast majority. I think we had, we had over 11,000. Um, it's actually been a, a bigger number than that. And we've had to reconcile. And, and part of the process, we have an app where players go in, if they're on the roster from the schools, they go in and they click on it and they, you know, they opt in. And then we go through a process of validating all that. And the problem is, you know, we started, we only had about three months from when we kicked it off to when we launched the game to try and get all these players in. That's a massive scale of players and to try and deliver the likenesses for them as well. Um, so we actually had to build a whole new set of tools that we've been investing in for a few years um, so that we could get just a, a single 2D image of a player and use some new character creation and head creating tools, something called Head Start that we built using a combination of machine learning with some light touch-ups from, from, you know, from some artists that we have on staff as well that are going in and making a few changes where we can. And we were able to get all these players in and, and they look fantastic. And, um, you know, broadly, it's been hugely successful. But yes, it's been over 11,000. It's actually been Beyond that, I think probably end up being more like twelve or thirteen thousand by the time we've gone through the iteration. The team's also been making updates, and I think the update that we've just come out recently with had brought in a, a new wave of players. Of course, when we started the process, there are freshmen from high schools that had not yet declared for their teams, and so the, the change in the churn of the real rosters that was always going to evolve, and so we needed to be able to dynamically update the game, which we've been doing along the way. Yeah, interesting. And do you anticipate the same $600 in a copy of the game, that deal to be offered next year? We are learning. So we're learning from this entire launch. It's been hugely successful. Um, I think as we look ahead to the future launches in the college franchise, we are going to, we'll take a look at the whole program, figure out, okay, what is the appropriate um, set of things that we're going to ask from players, uh, how much we're going to pay them. It's something we'll constantly be evaluating and looking at in the months ahead. One thing that I've I've been curious about for a little while about this is so um, college football the series went on a roughly ten year hiatus uh, because of an NIL dispute and EA could have put out another college football game in that whole period just without players' names, images, and likenesses or anything that you know looked like any actual players, but you opted not to until. That was it was legally possible to have this big NIL deal where you have the actual players in the game. Um, what went into that that thought process of deciding to not put out a game until you could do this? So you know, I will say because I was there, I was in the middle of it back in 2014 um, when we made that tough decision. A lot of it was just there was a much bigger conversation happening around college sports and amateurism. And it was not just video games. Video games was one small slice of a much bigger conversation about this idea of players getting compensated and, and you know, between the NCAA, the conferences, the schools, um, a major dispute. And, and I think the O'Bannon lawsuit, which was an EA Sports college basketball game related um, lawsuit, 
was the thing that triggered, that triggered this bigger conversation. But the conversation was about a far broader set of media and, and rights and, and compensation than just video games. We were one small sliver. Um, at the time, all things considered, given the, the landscape and how that space was evolving, it just made sense for us. It was, the, it was what was best for, I think, that conversation in the world of college sports for us to step away, reevaluate, um, allow those forces to work themselves out. And they, it took a long time, um, but we knew it would take time uh, for you know, all the forces at play to work through and get to out the other end to a resolution. So what we did was we continued to like keep our, eye, you know, our ears to the ground, keep the conversations going, our relationships with the college licensing organizations in the world of sports, uh, you know, making sure that we know what's happening along the way. As we started to see um, you know, these little rulings in various states and various territories and things that were happening along the way, um, we started gaining more and more confidence that there was going to be a resolution. It wasn't so much that we felt we needed this NIL construct to launch a game, but we didn't want to put our EA Sports brand on a product without having all of the schools and the conferences on board. We wanted everyone to be comfortable and feel good about putting out the product. Um, I don't believe, now we didn't try, but I don't believe we could have gotten all of the, the major schools and conferences on board without some resolution um, in the NIL space. That, that was just a, a piece that all parties involved, including us, wanted to make sure that we saw a through line to. I will say though, there came a moment, you know, a number of, a few years ago, three, four years ago, where we could see light at the end of the tunnel, but resolutions hadn't been solidified we had to take a leap of faith and start building this game because um, we knew it was going to take a few years. We had to rebuild modes and, and rebuild so many elements of this game um, that we knew we had to get started. And so we did get started before we had a through line to NIL. And we were in a position where we felt, well, if we don't have full NIL resolution, we could potentially launch it with completely generic rosters. Um, and we actually got to a point where the game was up and running. Um, with fully generic rosters that that not only were completely generic, but had systems in place to to check and make sure that even the randomized creation of characters would not infringe on on, on any real players. And so we we had it up and running, um, but we were all optimistic that we were going to get to this end goal. And and the fact that we were able to roll it out, put a program in place that was pretty complex, but also wide reaching, essentially going straight to the players with this app. And then the you know the the broad scale adoption of how many players accepted it and came in and, and embraced the game, um, and then we had to build we had to build over eleven thousand player likenesses into the game in three months, which is not doable with the tools that we've used in in traditional game development. So the fact that we were able to do that, use the tools, we got it done, we got it in there, and we've been updating, it's been remarkable. So in my long career in video games, over twenty six years making games. Um, one of the most remarkable feats that I've that I've seen um, as you know as we brought this to the close and got those all in. Uh, let's hop over to another of your most popular franchises. EA Sports FC is uh, the second iteration is launching worldwide. Friday early release is already out. Um, this is old news at this point, but obviously this used to be the FIFA series um, and. You know, I think was at the end of 2022, you um, you and FIFA parted ways. Um, what what essentially fell apart, or, or why was that? Why did that split happen? So first, FIFA were great partners for us for I think over 20 years, and um, it, it it was a, a great ride we had together. And in fact, I I hope we work together in, in the years ahead in a, in a different way, but. Um, you know, we have a vision of where we want to take the franchise, you know, growing FC out as this large scale, massive online community. You know, I talked about it in Investor Day, like building out a connected ecosystems, adding more modalities of play, more entry points for fans with all connected by player ID and connecting, you know, friends and the community together, um, building community led experiences where like members of the community can tr contribute content to that community. When you think about all the things that you want to do, both inside the game, around the game, and beyond the game, it means working with a wide variety of different partners. It, it means having the freedom, the creative freedoms to, to take some risks, to do some different things, to satisfy audiences 
broad audiences that have different motivations and the types of things that they want, type of content that they might want. And so we just got to a place where we had this big vision um, and we knew where we wanted to go with it. Um, and while, while FIFA were incredible partners, we were at a point where we were coming to an end of our existing deal. Uh, and ultimately we made the decision through those discussions, through you know trying to compare where we saw the franchises going together. Um, we felt that moving forward with our own brand was gonna give us the most flexibility to do the things that we needed to do and wanted to do to really grow out in, uh, this brand and take advantage of the opportunity. And it's gone very well. And, and in fact, like, you know, you can have, you know, the sleepless nights that people like myself went through along the way as we took one of the largest brands in video game history and completely rebranding this massive business. Um, you know, there was a risk that we took there, but we, we went after it with a, with a plan, a well thought through plan. Um, we also executed on other licensing deals through the biggest leagues and clubs around the world of sports to solidify the baseline of uh, you know, what we have and authenticity in our game as well. And we came out the other side, hugely successful. You know, the FC24 rebrand was one of the most successful um, things that, that you know, we've pulled off in, you know, in, the, in the history of EA Sports. I'm super proud of it. And it was no small feat. But we came out the other side strong, with record numbers for the franchise. Um, you know, over 150 million players, I think, joined us in our FC ecosystem in the past year. And, you know, now we have our own brand and our own IP to take forward. And the freedom and the ability and the flexibility to do all the things that we want to do to grow it into the future. That said, we still want to work with FIFA, um, particularly when it comes to things like World Cup. We'll continue to talk with them about some of the IP that they have and the events that they have. Um, they've been good partners and we would love to continue to part with them, partner with them in the future. So we'll keep talking with them as the, as the years go on. Sports are becoming more central just to the entire organization of media as streaming gradually replaces cable. We're seeing you know, the ongoing rise of sports docu-series and other storytelling as well. What does all that mean for you on your end? When we think about our ambition, you know, we, we want EA Sports to be the most valuable sports brand in the world. And we think we can get there. We have the most valuable audience. Um, younger generations, Gen Z, Gen Alpha sports fans, they're gamer first generations in terms of their preferred method, you know, their preferred, preferred uh, form of entertainment. And, uh, and so their fandom, a lot of it is formed through our games, their favorite clubs, their favorite athletes, the, the leagues that they follow. Even, you know, their engagement in our games will influence their motivation to participate in sports and connect to friends and so on. So we're in this incredible position there. And then as we see the world of sports evolve as well, uh, along with those younger generations and how they consume sports, these are not generations that sit and watch three hour broadcasts of games. They watch highlights and they watch social media posts. They follow athletes both on and off the field. And, you know, we see this incredible opportunity to bring more of that sports content into our ecosystem. So when we build out more modalities of play with a connected ecosystem of players, and then we think around our games, the types of type of content that they want to watch, the, the stuff that they want to create and contribute content to the community, and also their consumption of sports content that's beyond our games as well, which is, you know, we announced the EA Sports app, which is something where we're going to be launching later this fall, uh, focusing in La Liga in Spain with the world of, of soccer, but with ambitions to go broad across sports. We do believe that we can take this massive audience of connected sports fans that play our games and go beyond that audience and give them the types of sports experiences and the types of sports content that they want to follow. And, you know, connecting that within the gaming community as well, we think we can serve that, that, that audience in a really interesting way. Um, so our ambition is to go, to go once again around our games, beyond our games, and then having one big connected ecosystem of players and fans uh, that connect through EA Sports, not just our games, not just watching people play our games and the content around our games and, and the content they create, but also in consuming the types of short form kind of sports content that they're really interested in uh, when they're connected with their friends. All right, we'll, we'll leave it there. Cam Weber, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Okay, thank you.
Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. Thursday night's match between the Cowboys and the Giants was the most streamed regular season game in NFL history. The game averaged 16.2 million viewers on Amazon Prime. Thursday night's record-breaking viewership was just one of many for the NFL in 2024. This year's season opener between the Chiefs and the Ravens was the most watched NFL kickoff game ever. The opening week slate of games averaged its highest number of viewers at 21 million per game. The Kansas City Chiefs alone are setting records every week with their game against the Bengals becoming the most watched game in September in 26 years. The NFL is also finding more and more ways to reach its ever-growing audience. The league brought Thursday Night Football to Amazon Prime in 2022, debuted on Peacock in 2023, and is premiering on Netflix with two games on Christmas Day of this year. It's safe to say that the NFL is still king and the era of cord cutting is always looking for ways to expand its domain. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, share it with a friend and send us a message at today at frontofficesports.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.